Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar. Um, this is the second of our sort of mini series, I guess, this week, um, where we will be discussing, or where Richard and Barry will be discussing the differences between um, the professional services contract and its short form. Um, anyone, um, as, uh, sorry, as you guys are watching along, if you have any questions, please drop that in the Q&A section um, and I'll uh, pick those up and um, drop those questions in to our host. So um, yeah, without further ado, I'll let you guys um, introduce yourselves. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming along. Some of you may have been with us two days ago where we did a very similar session on the difference between the big construction contract and the short contract. Today, we're focusing on professional services. Um, just to make it more interesting, last week, I went across to Barry's office in, in Huntingdon from Cambridge. Yeah. And today, Barry's made the effort to, to drive over to me in Cambridge, just, just so we can sit side by side. And uh, the problem with that is, is having two enthusiasts this close together, yeah. there is a risk a of some, some sort of explosion. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, we'll hopefully to give you something useful. So that's me on the left, Barry on the right. Um, I've been with Mott McDonald since I was a small child and I have been close to NEC, helped move from three to four, as did Barry, and also helped draft the X29 recently. Barry? Yeah, so by Treb. So uh, as I say, along with Richard, I've been using the NEC conference since so we're in the consultative version, which is way back in 1991 scarily Barry's uh, going off now. enough yeah so <laughs> um so yeah so really we just like to share our knowledge and experience with you and I think as re me and Richard always say there's always new experiences so please feel free to ask questions um we had that, a really good that, sessions about from that, the last session that, as well the question so Barry and I've just spent a bit of time this morning answering some of the questions that came yep. in last time so we'll do the same thing again for this session but hopefully we'll get a chance to answer them sort yep. of face to face as we go through so it is all started. Um, Richard Patterson is a is a really sad and enthusiastic sharer. Generally, a serial sharer. I'm a serial sharer. So mm -hmm. in Mott McDonald, I'd already drafted a document comparing the big contract with a little contract, and I went to NEC and said, "I think this is worthy of sharing with the world." So I worked with Peter Higgins, who's the chair of the NEC board, to develop this little note. It's only three pages. It's very very short, and basically this presentation is around. The contents of that note yeah and i think it's something to say in it that the contract board feel that perhaps the short contract doesn't get used as much Absolutely. as it possibly could do because i think we're going to do a poll one do we that, have a poll are we going to do a poll i don't know whether we're going to bother yeah. with a poll phone are you it's a question is to see whether you've actually used the contract i yeah. don't know whether we can do that sure, yeah. i've, I've launched the poll now so anyone uh watching along if you guys could just answer that and um if uh, Richard and Barry, if you guys want to click the poll button, polls button at the bottom there, you should yeah. be able to see yeah. a live. Yeah, a it's still going, still, still going. going. Again, again, totally what we sort of, what we, actually there's a lot of people on the course who haven't even used the PSC, which is a surprise, but that's mm. good. Don't worry, you're in the right place. And, and not at all surprising that less people have used a short contract. Yeah, so 60% of people are saying they've used effectively PSC, 40% roughly haven't used the PSC. And then the Short contract, we've got um thirty-three percent and sixty-seven percent no. So maybe kind of the contract border kind of uh, just the idea that we you know, maybe it's an opportunity after today to think about using the short contract. Well, that, that that's mm. the whole point of it. That what yeah. we find in my training um normally, I I start off with a slide saying, Why don't we use NEC? This is about talking to people who've never used it before. Mm. And the main reason people don't use something new is because they don't know it. And the same thing applies to this situation here. If a client's been using the big PSE for five years, they've got used to it, they've got their systems in place, and they don't really want the hassle of doing anything different. So the purpose of today's session is to make clear that there is an alternative. We can't tell you which one to use. All we can do is give you some pointers for you to make that decision. Now, this slide to start off is basically a summary of the whole session, but I think it's worth doing. Um, basically, the, the PSC is the short version is simpler. It's designed for low risk and fairly simple contracts. We don't have any options in it. We'll talk about the detail of that later. Um, 
the way it was set up again we'll talk about this later was so such that you could almost buy it off the shelf and fill it in the various parts of the document which in the real world of course in the electronic world is never going to happen we don't have a service manager again those of you who have not yet moved from psc3 to psc4 won't know what i'm talking about because psc4 introduced a service manager as an intermediary between the client and the consultant to do all the day-to-day -day contract management basically doing exactly the same roles as the project manager does in the ECC, the big construction contract. In the short contract, though, we don't have that. We just got client and consultant. The way it's set up, you can have a mix of lump sums or quantities, and there's also provision to do work, what's NEC's language, on a time charge basis. In other words, reimbursable, pay them by the hour. Critically, there's no requirements in the conditions for a program other than a prompt that if you want to have some details in a program, put it in the scope. And the compensation event process is simpler. Um, quotation is submitted at the same time as notification. Either side can put in assumptions. There's no option for getting a revised quotation. This is quite radical. Mm. So my answer to that is, well, bloody talk. Sorry, you've got to talk to each other. Yeah, Mustn't I, swear, think sorry. I think that is a critical thing, actually, with this because of the shortened process. I think the, I think as we discussed before, you know, the magic does to me always only say, yes, we've got some really good processes in the full professional services contract, but it shouldn't replace the fact that you need to talk to each other. And yeah. that obviously it can really help to make those processes run a lot smoother. Absolutely. And, and going up a level... The main reason why a client is advised to use the NEC is because it's better than any other contract on mm. keeping control of your project. That's yeah. what the compensation event process is all about. Yeah. Anyway, that's just a really high level heads up. Mm. If by the end of this course, you remember that lot, we've probably done quite well. Yeah. That's OK. Good. And I think and I suppose the other big thing, of course, is what which NEC would say is it's not just about using it for construction. Well, absolutely. Really good point. Yeah. If you want a lawyer to do you something, you yeah. could use the professional services short contract. Why yeah. not? Yeah, you could point. They might that. have a small fit <laughs> if they gave you a PSC, but there's no reason at all. I'm sure they'll heavily but, offend it. Why, it's your Star Trek version, Rich, <laughs> by the end, I'm sure. <laughs> I, do, I do love Barry with his Star Trek versions of the contract. <laughs> um, okay, so we've split this, this session pretty logically, hopefully, into contract preparation and then contract management. So starting off with putting it together, Firstly, it's a lot shorter. The full PSC has got no less than 66 pages of obviously fun stuff to read. But, you know, it's a contract. You're going to have to read the contract. Wouldn't it be better if you only had 16 pages to read? That'd be nice, wouldn't it? That's the professional services short contract. And I think what it highlights, well, as we go through this, it highlights the fact that what you've, you've almost got down to the essentials of a, of a basic contract. So... You know, you and as we'll see as we go through, when we go through the build the sections, you'll see that we've got to think about certain things if we want something a little bit more than just an absolute basic contract. There are key features, aren't there? That, we've got to that think we about. might have to add a, a little bit more in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> those of you that know the PSC, this is not new to you. There are three payment options. They've got the lovely letters, which are consistently used across the NEC family. A for a, effectively a lump sum. C for a target and E for a cost reimbursable time-based contract. In contrast, the PSC, Professional Services Short Contract, has just got a document called a price list. And that price list is a mix of, or can be a mix of, either lump sums and or quantities times rate. So for example, if you had a, a, a project which was a, a consultant who was gonna go and do 100 bridge assessments and it was a very standard bridge assessment you could have that as a rate a price per bridge assessment for example yeah but you might also have lump sums that's up to you as a client how you write the price list so it's very definitely a priced contract you can see that we don't have any target or cost oh hang on we don't have any target contract options yeah so those of you that know the construction contract you'll see a bit of a mix of A and B. So again, B in the construction contract is a bill of quantities. 
And that's effectively what you could do with this price list. Yeah. The price list requires you to include what it calls the method and rules used to compile the price list. And for those of you that know QSing, that's the equivalent of what we call in our industry a method of measurement. And it's a method of measurement that is called for in a construction contract, bill of quantities contract. Yeah. But complication here, but also a good thing for the short contract. We can also have work which is paid for quotes on a time charge basis, which effectively means the bidder has given us rates for different grades of people, maybe different individual people, depends how you set it up. Those, rate, those rates will be in the price list and we just pay them by the hour or by the day, however you set it up. So a cost reimbursable effectively. It's effectively. So it's interesting isn't it? because reimburs- really you've still got the flexibility. You've got the flexibility in the PSC and the PSSC. You've also got the flexibility as well. When you look at it, it's a kin, you've got an and, A and a B and E. And we get, so you've got the same thing. And we're going yeah. to come on to a little story now, which is to try and show you that you've probably actually got potentially more flexibility in the short contract. So firstly, it is quite simple. As I said, this price list includes that method and rules to compile the price list. But then there's a clause which clients need to be aware of, may be worried about. If you if there is a mistake in that price list, which is either due to a departure from the rules that you've set out, or quite worryingly due to an ambiguity or inconsistency. And you can see that second bullet point is a very open clause. So if there's an ambiguity between what it says in the scope and what it says in the price list, the supplier, the consultant may well say, well, that needs to be corrected. I need an item in for that. It's not in the price list. And then guess what? If the client does that, if the client does give that instruction, that is one of the listed compensation events in the contract for which the consultant will get time and or more money. Who's produced it? So that means the the correctness of the price list is a client risk. Now, in some cases, particularly if you want a lump, so if you if you are wanting a lot of rates, rates times quantity, then normally the client will be the person writing that price list because they'll decide how we want to set out those yeah. quantities. In contrast, if the client wants a lump sum, it's totally normal to let the the consultant write out their own price list, therefore telling the the client when they want paying for the various chunks of work, which makes up the whole of the work. But even if the consultant does that, these clauses are still in your contract. And Barry and I have discussed this at length, and we've agreed that that if that is the case, then it can't be right for the client to have the risk of the correctness of the price list. And the only way to sort that out, I don't like it. We're, we're, yeah, from, no, we're from, going to have trouble saying this. Night, we're, we're doing this from NEC's <laughs> perspective. We're sat here today with NEC. I haven't got a Mott Madonna logo behind me. I've got an NEC logo behind me. But I'm going to tell you that if you want to change that, you're going to have to change that. And you're going to have to basically delete those two clauses mm. if you don't want the client to have that risk of the mistakes or in, in, in ambiguities in the price list. Now, some of you will know that Richard Patterson is a very strange person who is addicted to writing little articles. And that's one I wrote a couple of years ago now, specifically explaining the point that I've just made. So there's a link to it there. If you're interested, go and have a look. Okay, so this is still a related subject. In the professional services short contract sort of guidance within the document it has this line the contract does not provide for the consultant to be paid on a mixture of time charge and prices and one or the other must be selected that's what nec says and then richard patterson i don't i I just can't cope with that because clause 50.3 hang on a minute i could be radical let me see if i can do this just, just, just bear with me. Just talk amongst yourself for two seconds. 50.3, because when I'm training normally, uh, for heaven's sake, let me just do this. Let's try the answer. Oh, it doesn't want to do it for me. Oh, I've blown it. Ignore that. I was trying to bring up the clause itself. Never mind. 50.3 actually says 
there's, there's, there's a series of bullet points in 50.3, which is the amount due, and that includes lumps in the price list yeah. and and or items in the uh, on a time charge basis. I don't know what's going on there. Never mind. I'll move on. OK, so again, Richard Patterson, only last month, this month, um, I've put that into words. Little article which got published in the very latest NEC newsletter is basically me arguing with NEC and saying, well, I'm sorry, NEC, but I think we can use it. You've got to be you careful, want it, be careful it, you? with it. Yeah, you often want that, don't you? I think is often there is a case where you want that kind of mix of things rather where, than where just being got one some, or the other. Yeah, exactly. We've got no, something to work. Yeah. Obviously, in any contract, you can always give the consultant some more work. Hmm. But if you've got a priced hmm. contract and then you want some more work, you're going to have to do each chunk of work as a priced additional. If you actually want to do some extra work on a time charge basis, I think you should be able to do that. And I've tried to articulate that in this little article. OK, move on. So PSC has got a whole raft of secondary options. Yeah, they're not meant to be reading this, are they, Rich? They're not meant to be reading. No, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. Times, <laughs> times, Roman, times Roman three point. Thanks, Barry. Don't try and read that. <laughs> yeah. Just believe me that there is a lot of options. Yeah. Um, and you can guess that I might be saying something about X7 on the next press of the mouse. Yeah. Because the professional services contract does not have any of these options. But as a standard, it does have delay options. Hmm. But in the contract data, the client is required to state how much the contract the consultant is going to have to pay if they're a day late or for each day late. And obviously, the client can set that to zero if they want to. Yeah. Now, when you look down that long list of options, the most obvious one, to be honest, is inflation. So X1 in the PSC, you're going to include that if you want the client to take the risk of inflation. Now, for the last 10 years of NEC training, that's been almost irrelevant because there wasn't much inflation. But now there's significantly more inflation. And just to be clear, there is no X1 in the short contract. Therefore, who's taking the risk of inflation? Very definitely yes. the client, yeah. the consultant. Client. And the I think this is the thing, the, sorry, isn't it? The consultant. The there's consul no, there's yeah. no X1. The consultant's, taking, the that consultant's risk. taking that risk. I think the thing is as well, isn't it? Because obviously the, the, you know, these, this, this, the base contract is set up that, you know, this, this is maybe an, an idea about because I think one of the things we all come to is you know this could be a long term contract you know with, with simple requirements in terms of management but could be over a long period of time so you need inflation indeed or it could be maybe what was envisaged that the short contract would be effectively for a very short period so it might be just for a two or three weeks exactly. or a few and, months and therefore you wouldn't need X one and therefore like any other contract you've got to understand what you're doing because you are writing a deal between two parties yeah. and so what I would say is if you are choosing to use mm. the professional services short contract at least have a look at that list on the left yeah, absolutely. and yeah. realize you haven't got them. Yeah. If you then want to bring them into your contract, you can normally do that as relatively clear additional conditions because the NEC's drafting is generally so very, very clear. But do it carefully and don't get carried away because then you will turn your nice little short contract into a horrible <laughs> bastardized mess. Hybrid between hybrid, yeah, sorry, yeah, hybrid, hybrid is a much better word than bastardized. Yeah, yeah. Okay, PSC again has got the three options with UK in it, which I call jurisdiction specific options for obvious yeah. reasons. In the case of the professional services contract, we don't mess about with one or two, but we do have a clause relating to the Housing Grants Act. Yeah. So there's literally a box in the client's yeah. contract data to say whether or not that applies. If it does apply, <clears> then <throat> there's four clauses right at the back of the document which actually puts that those words into your contract. And, and I think it needs we do to, actually we're just strange we're discussing that actually once before the this webinar started. You got to you do need to think about it very carefully about whether it falls into the definition of being a construction operation. So yeah, exactly. That that's a, that's the detail of how the Housing Grants Act is set up. Mm. Okay, move on. So you're all used, so you're not all, most of you will be used to option Z, which is the additional conditions of contract. We've got the same thing in the PSSC, but don't call it Z. It hasn't got a name. It is just additional contract conditions. And they're stated at the end of the contract data. If there's only three or four, you write them straight in the contract data. If you've got a two or three pages, 
my recommendation is to call is to point to appendix one to the contract data and have your additional conditions in a nice clear and sort of titled part of and the I document. Think there's a key thing there, Richard, on the on the Z clause in it, but it, as we kind of touched on that, if you're finding yourself having to add lots of Z clauses, maybe the short contract isn't the way to go. It I is, think you've got to, and, and again, what, what I like about it, although we're not calling them Z clauses, the additional conditions of contract is something that Peter Higgins of the contract board, I always like this idea, is he, he always says, what's the mischief that you're trying to deal with in the Absolutely, death clause. And yes. the same thing would apply here. What, what's the thing that you're concerned about Absolutely. on the short contract yeah. that you need to pick up? And, may, and and as Richard said, maybe some of that is if you look at that list in the PSC, right, oh, yeah, actually, we need to deal with yeah, this exactly. liability or whatever it might be. Yeah. Well, again, it's probably too much for today, but whenever yeah. I'm drafting additional conditions, yeah. I strongly recommend you have a table of four columns in Word, a yeah. reference, the words that you're putting in, then some explanation as to why you think those words are necessary, mm. and then just use the fourth column for comments around the team while you're putting this document together. That works very, very well. In mm. terms of the structure, the PSC is set up such that the contract data very neatly points to all the other documents that are part of your contract. The PS, the short contract, unusually, has got templates for scope and a template for the price list like, as, as we said before, it's almost like they're just ready to be filled in. It's almost mm -hmm. like NEC thought you were going to buy the thing from NEC, get your, your, quill, yeah. your quill pen out and write it in. That doesn't really happen in the world, and we'll see the consequences mm. of that. Unless it's very, very simple, Richard. Unless it's Certainly very, very, way. very you simple. Do, you okay. could do that, yeah. but generally, okay. you probably find you've then got to point out to a more detailed document. Indeed. Mm. So, again, Barry and I have discussed this, and we both agree that... I, it doesn't say it in the contract, but it, I think it would be good if you have got a separate scope document, yeah. it's good to point to it. Good yeah, and that's practice. what we're going to show on this picture. So I like pictures. So the document, there's a document called the contract data. Again, the language is consistent between all the contracts in NEC. The first one is called the client's contract data. So it's not called part one, which is ECC. In its short contract, it's called the client's contract data. That points to the conditions of contract and any additional conditions that you might want. But oddly, that's the only pointer in the PSSC contract data. The documents that we're going to need are the scope, which tells the consultant what we want. And then we have the consultant's contract data coming back from the bidder. And that will normally will always include a completed price list. There's also in the document a one pager, which is the consultant's offer and acceptance. Again, the idea is it's all there just to fill in. Obviously, the various documents require things to be stated in the other documents. So to be clear, this contract data picture, there's a lot of other data in the contract data. This is only showing the documents yeah. related to the contract. As we said, that's all set out in the one document. And as we've said once, but I'm trying to show it on a picture. Hmm. We think it's it's good to add in an entry to point to the scope and to the price list. So there's no question about which document. And I think it's worth adding as well, isn't it? That idea, that simple idea of having the consultant's offer and the client's acceptance. I mean, I think what we, we were again discussing that earlier today, and we, we've often found that people then still want to have a form of agreement to go with again, it. Again, uh, and that was the next little line on my slide. Mm. Some people want a form of agreement because sometimes there might be some tweaks and changes yeah, between things, tender yeah. And, and the actual signing up of the contract. <laughs> so again, hopefully that's a useful picture. I like pictures. There's a lot of information on that picture. Okay, that's all we've got to say on contract preparation. Good time to break if there's any questions so far on contract preparation. Farhan, anything in there or, or should we carry on? No, carry on. I think um, the presentation so far has been so watertight that there's no follow-up questions. No, oh, there so we that, are. That's, that's, all, that, that's always... Now, a, that's, now that's you're always... just playing to Richard now, <laughs> no, no. being, you know, his first are, are big you, water. Are you, are you telling me there's, there's been no <laughs> ambiguity in the scope so far? Okay, contract management. Let's move on. Firstly, as Barry knows, this is Richard Patterson's favourite ever slide. I presented this slide God knows how many times. These are the first two clauses in any NEC contract. The first one, very simply, it says, do what it says in the chuffing contract. And that's what it says in the very first line. So yeah. there's no doubt about that. We've all signed up to this and, deal. 
Yeah. And the evidence for that, of course, is it the UK adjudicators did that survey. Yeah. And, and this is what I use now. My strap line is 49% of all adjudications occur because people just haven't followed the contract. Because they haven't done, done what they said. Exactly. So if you wanted justification of that, there right, we are. That's a good line. Yeah. And then you can't do what it says in the contract unless you first, I'll give you a second <laughs> to think about it. Yeah. Read the chuffing contract. I'm sorry it's boring, but it's okay. It's only 16 pages. You can yeah. do it in half an hour. But then the second line is more complicated. What on earth do we mean by mutual trust and cooperation? There is mm. acres of press out there, lawyers arguing about what that means. I don't care. All I'm going to tell you is talk to each other. For many years, my slide here said talk to each other. And then somebody on a training course said, Richard, I think you're missing something here. How about we also listen to each other? Yes. Isn't that a nice idea? So Taltio, I can I recommend that also for anybody that's got any sort of relationships at home, you know, husbands, wives, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever. <laughs> Taltio is a practice at home. This. Uh, well, funnily <laughs> enough, my wife tells me I'm not very good at listening, Barry. But uh, listen, there's too much fun. Um, so genuinely, though, uh, people yeah, on the call, if you do not get everybody in the team to do those three things, yeah. your NEC contract will fail. Yeah, It's that simple. I think it's, you, you agree, Brad? I agree I've been, totally. I mean, but, I think, you know, I've had trade. I mean, it's one of my couple of my pet questions, really, but I often refer to Richard when we're talking about these names here. And it's sometimes an interesting what Richard often does is just stick them up on a board and say, what does that mean? Yeah. But the point is that, so, you know, I'm, I'm continually amazed because my couple of my pet questions are, right, have you seen? So you, you go to a team that's starting to apply. Have you, see, have you seen the contract data? Have you read the contract data? No, I haven't seen that. Have you have you read you know have you read the the any additional conditions? No, I haven't read that. Have you seen the scope? No, I haven't done that. I've absolutely no idea what you're managing at that point. And so yeah, that's a way. So you've got to check on that, haven't you? You got people claiming to come for a bit of training, but they haven't even vaguely yeah. read the contract before. Get yourself yeah, in, yeah. in, in, in get yeah, yourself yeah. on the screen, Barry. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to break these things down one to nine, so you can see how we're getting on. Section one, um, as we've already mentioned, the PSC four has got a service manager. The PSC short contract has, it's quite hard to say PSSC, isn't it? I'm it stopping is, that. It is, yeah. I'm going to say the short contract. Yeah, the short, contract, short, contract, short contract, contract has just got a client, <laughs> but the client can delegate. So it's quite quite normal for the client to delegate out to different people. Yeah. Again, on a short contract, normally this can be done in-house by a, by a client. You wouldn't normally need any other consultant to help yeah. out. In the professional services contract, this is a massive change from PSC3 to PSC4, by the way. The changes in the PSC4 about how we're going to measure cost has basically made the PSC very similar to the construction contract. So in the PSC4, we've now got very detailed documents called the schedule and the short schedule of cost components. And they're used for the assessment of compensation events for all the options. And they're used for the direct payment for option C and E. So if you employ Mott McDonald, to do to work for you under a PSCE, you're gonna you're gonna be able to see Richard Patterson's salary. It's all open book. Very very different to the old days when we had rates. Simplistically though, on the short contract side, we've got a much simpler definition of cost. The people get paid at people rates, which are tendered. The work any work which is sub subcontracted, the consultant can pass on directly the amount they pay to their subconsultant. And don't forget that that definition of defined cost is only used for compensation events. Again, next story, early warning. Big issue with NEC, fantastic part of the whole NEC way of working. We're going to talk to each other. We're going to try and sort out problems. And then simplistically, the big contract has got early warnings, a register and meetings. The short contract has got just the early warnings. And then this clause... Consultant client cooperate in making and considering proposals, dot, 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 working out how these issues can be avoided or reduced, dot, dot, dot. The consultant cooperate in making. Now, how's that going to happen? I think you might have a meeting. What a radical idea. And what? where do you think you're going to put these early warnings? If you're a little logical, I think you're going to put them on a register. Even though you can see on the right hand side, those are not defined terms because they're not in the short contract. Yeah. But anybody with half a brain who knows NEC will keep a register of early warnings and will set up a routine but yeah. early warning meeting. And that's a perfect example of of really bringing it down right down to its basics. Absolutely. Absolute basics. Yeah. 
Yeah, so and by, if, if you pick up PSE, you could say, well, it's pretty obvious. We're just going to work together and talk to each other. Mm. But NEC's got, you know, half a page of text on, maybe a whole page of text on, yeah. on the early warning process. Short contract keeps it shorter. Providing the service. Due skill and care and in PSE short contract is exactly the same. So we're definitely under a due skill and care obligation, which is very important for all consultants on the planet. Subcontractors, the professional services contract, like its construction big brother, has got requirements to get subcontractors accepted and then to get the subcontracts accepted. That's not improper, mm. quite logical. Short contract, have a guess what the short contract's got. I'd love if I had people in the room properly in front of me. <laughs> Barry, you have a guess. What's the short contract got, Barry? Oh, very simple. Absolutely oh, yeah. diddly squat. Yeah. It's got absolutely no client oversight on subcontracting. Yeah. I can tell you now, some clients will want some inserted. You're going to do yeah. that via, you could write that in the scope, yeah. but probably need to, to write that in as an additional condition. Where would you go for those words for the additional condition? You'd nick them from the professional services contract. It's all very simple. Okay, big one. Number three is program and time. PSC has got the most detailed requirements of a program in any contract on the planet. They're exactly the same as the requirement for the construction contract. So in training, I normally say to people, you've got a little job for a consultant, a little small consultant doing a little report for you. The program requirements are exactly the same as for Balfour BT Vancey, who are building high speed two. That can't be right, can it? <laughs> it's copied across from the UCC. Yeah. What it does, though, is have a direct reference to the accepted program to help use the accepted program to determine what um what, what delay to the completion date the consultant is due due to a compensation event psc as we've already intimated has got something much simpler yeah one line the consultant submits programs to the client as stated in the scope so it can be whatever you want it to be absolutely this is a common thing by the way on passing yeah. and there's there's several references from the conditions to the scope so you've got to make sure something is said, but you've got to decide for your project, for your level of complexity, how much detail do you want in the program? Do you need that program to be accepted by the client? There's none of that in the short contract. Nothing real acceptance. All the consultant does have to do, though, remember, it's only a short contract, is forecast the date of completion each week, start from the starting date until completion. Yeah. It's interesting that each week malarkey, don't forget the word short in professional services, short contract. Well, I've shown you it's shorter. It's got less pages. Yeah. It's not necessarily for a short duration, although the fact that we've got yeah. a program update well, every yeah. week suggests that it, it might Well, be. I think that's the point, isn't it? I think those words, aren't they, are particularly for something that's going to maybe, it might only last a few days. It might it, last yeah, yeah. you know, a couple of weeks or three anyway. or four weeks. But it may well be, again, something that you would tweak because actually, if it was like maybe over several months, you might be then happy to to it have that. that week to a month. Yeah, maybe. So that would exactly. be, be a little tweak, wouldn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Good, good point. So, again, to remind you, there's absolutely no reference to program in the assessment of the compensation events in the short contract. But I do think it's, a, it's, it's interesting because this came up on Tuesday in terms of the. Uh, engineering construction short contract about you know um, a note about the program if you know somebody mentioned again yeah. and of course the program is important so how important is the program you know what interfaces have you got do you need any sections put possibly so they are all things that you've got to think about so again it's tuning that that level of you've got an independent piece of work that's not yeah. connected to anything compared to something it might be a small piece of work but it's a critical piece of work to feed in to i don't know the contract to do yeah, another yeah, thing yeah. or another consultant wherever it may be yeah. Absolutely. Just one thing that Barry said there about sections. Don't forget, if you do want sections, yeah. short contract has not got a sectional completion option. You'll have, to, have to build that in. in before you even start. Absolutely. Yeah. In the PSC, the big PSC has got key dates where we've got to meet certain conditions. It's got an option for sectional completion. There's a clause for acceleration. Mm. Have a wild guess what the short contract's got. Diddly squat. None <laughs> of that. Yeah. So again, a good example whenever you think of a short contract for people like us who are sad contracts nerds you always want to go back and well what have they dropped out what didn't we need mm. and this is a really good example because short contract none of those 
I think what it what it also represents, Rich, is the fact that although it's simple, you've got to think you've got to sit down and think about what your objectives are. And from oh, a big, procurement big point, you've got to think about big that, time. definitely. So PSC, we're into quality now. PSC specifically requires a quality management system to be used by the consultant. And there are processes for the four things that you've already read. On the short contract side, why is it not talking to me? Short contract has got no requirement for a quality management system, but you could put it in the scope if you wanted it. And again, simple processes for those things. So a lot of parallels, to be honest, in section four. Payment, which we talked about before. This is now talking about the basic payment processes. PSC has an application from the consultant and assessment by the service manager. The language is different in the short contract. There's an assessment and an invoice from the consultant. Interestingly, the big PSC does not mention the invoice. I'm going to leave it there because we haven't got time to get into many more details. Don't worry. Obviously, if the consultant is asking for too much money, that can be corrected by the client. There's delay damages as an option, which we talked about. And then oddly, even though the contract does not require a program, <laughs> if the client has said we want a program, which, as we've just showed you, will be in mm. the scope, we have got the PSC clause, mm. which well, deducts, retains 25% of the money until we get a decent program. I suppose, to be fair, it doesn't say that we don't want a program. We want a program as That's defined right. in the oh, scope. Okay. All right. Sorry, Barry. <laughs> Barry, I'm being, being pedantic. There we are. Sorry. It's nice. This, this is why Barry and I are sat side by side, because Barry could just chip in and, and uh, yeah. correct me. So that's a quality. And then also in, in NEC4, in the big contracts, the market said they wanted a specific yeah. clause for final assessment. Yeah. We haven't got that in the short contract. Compensation events. Let's look at Simon. How are we doing? 40, uh, 30, no, we're right. Yeah. So PSC has got a two-stage process. There's a notification of the compensation event. If the service manager says, yeah, fair enough, mate, give us a quotation, then we get the quotation. We've got assumptions can be stated in the quotations, but they can only come from the service manager. Those assumptions, by the way, are where the service manager wants to take risk away from the consultant. So we bid that quotation on the assumption that dot, dot, dot. And then if that assumption proves to be incorrect, there's then another clause allowing another compensation event as a result of the correction of that assumption. It's a really good process in compensation events. Service manager has got three options when they get in a quotation. They can either accept it. They can say, no, bugger off. I'm going to do it myself. Sorry, no, I'm going to do it myself. Or they can ask for a revised quotation. And in the PSC, if, if the service manager hasn't responded to a quotation, there's a clause which allows the consultant to prompt them. And if they don't respond within a couple of weeks after that prompt, then the, the quotation is effectively treated as, us contracts people, we say deemed accepted. So that's a few facts about the PSC. In the short contract, the quotation comes in at the same time as the consultant says they think they've got a compensation event. The assumptions can be put in the quotation by either the client or the consultant. And this really comes back to what Barry was saying again earlier. Talk to each other. Yeah. Let's have a sit down. Have what assumptions yeah. should we put in this quotation? Because yeah. I'm trying to come to a quotation that you can accept because we are working collaboratively together. Mm -hmm. Um, again, as mentioned, I think before, there's no clause to ask for a revision. The client's only got two options. Either they accept it or they refine it and tweak it and send it back to the consultant. And that's what you're going to get. We're trying to keep it short and simple and get these compensation events done very quickly. One thing we haven't got on the slides here is the time periods. The time periods for all of this are significantly shorter also in the short contract. And this is a scary one that I'm sure many clients will have to think they can change because if the client doesn't respond within two weeks, there's no need for a further prompt. Ping! Clock's gone to midnight. Quotations yeah, yeah. accepted. Yeah. Interesting, that one. OK, and we've drawn out a picture again. This is a, clause, a picture I use for all my training. So as an example, on the left-hand side are compensation events caused by the client, the most obvious one being a change in scope. We haven't got time for all the detail today, but in magenta or whatever color that is, 
these are the clauses numbers that the people are going to have to use so 14.2 allows the client to change the scope two minutes later the consult the client is then sorry this yes the, the client is then required to notify the fact that they've just caused a compensation event at that point they will tell the consultant what compensation it was and they will instruct the quotation normally unless they determine that the reason for the change was a fault of the consultant that's not going to be the case in the in the in the, in the case of a change to the scope but remember this left hand side is generically anything that's been caused by the consult by the client now, this does give you the time periods in the big contract the consultant's got three weeks to put together a quote here we've only got one week they come back under clause 61.2 and they're going to have to look at all those clauses to help them develop the quotation. I'm not going to pretend to go through all of those clauses. Yeah. And the time scales are a reflection of the fact, again, again that it's probably going to be so simpler work. And it's easier probably to going to be lower value compensation correct. events and we can just get In it theory. sorted. Then the, the, the client's got two weeks to reply. As we've said, well, firstly, there's four reasons in the clause to, to say no, not going to have it. But otherwise, the only options are to accept. We can't ask for a revision. We either accept or we do a client assessment of that compensation event. And then straight away, the clause says after that acceptance, it's not revised. Again, subtle difference. NEC PSC has the term implemented compensation events. That does not appear in the short contract. So left hand side there, that's it. So to get a deal done, can you see you're going to need four bits of paper? 14.2, 61.1, 61.2, 62.2. The idea is that you can sit in a room and sort them all out and write yeah, them down. very quickly and easily. Yeah. And you can, of course, there are in the cloud systems to help you manage these contracts. I'm happy to say that Mott McDonald has recently signed up to a, a deal with one of those providers um, for PSC and the short contract. On the right hand side, this is a, con a compensation event which is due to, to, which isn't directly in caused by an instruction of the client. So for example, if the client is late in responding, the consultant has a compensation event, but they've got to notify that within four weeks of becoming aware. They do that with a 61.1 clause, the same clause as on the other side of the page. Um, and then they submit a quotation straight away, as we've said, and because of that, my arrow goes drop straight down to that period. They do that within two weeks. Sorry, they do the quotation and then the client has got two weeks to respond based on all the stuff that we've shown you down in the left hand side of the picture down here. And then just to finish it off again, already mentioned if and I haven't mentioned this one before yet. If the consultant doesn't give us a quote within a week, the, the client can't just sit there and argue and say, well, come on, where is it? Under this contract, the client is required to tell the consultant how much money they're going to get. Mm. So how's that for a really good incentive to sit down and get it sorted if yeah. you are on the... And I think, you know, that goes to the heart plan. of it. It goes to the heart of the NEC contract yeah. itself, isn't it? Because, you know, I think we discussed the other day the idea that, you know, NEC to me is about the step, what I call the staircase of certainty. And so basically, we're trying to drive the certainty. So you do need to step in. Or if you don't respond, be aware that, you know, that the inspector is going to have treated except. And that's all the idea is to try and help us to, to, to understand, to, give and, that greater certainty of outcome, which is what Martin and, Barnes was always trying and, to achieve. And, and pushes. I will so, tell yeah. you that particularly on the client side, there are some mm. clients that really don't like this time pressure. They don't like being no, pushed. No. And yet their bosses are the ones that want the jobs flipping sorted. Mm. And therefore, that's what you've got to do if you're using NEC. Mm. Again, reminder, we said this one already. If the if the client hasn't responded to a quotation within two weeks, ping, it's accepted. Yeah. Remarkable. OK, number seven, we're moving along. PSC has got some details about rights to use material provided by the consultant um, for the purpose stated in the scope. So that's an interesting one. The lawyers don't like that because that means the people writing the scope mm -hmm. have got to think a little bit about intellectual property, whatever the yeah, right yeah. the client wants. Yeah. The PSC short contract has got exactly the same. Eight is liabilities and insurances. We've got uh, in the standard PSC, every client liability is also a compensation event. This is a real subtle part of NEC. I mm. haven't really got time to do it. The client liability gives the consultant a little bit more protection 
than just a compensation event. There's requirements to submit certificates, and there's a mechanism for, to set up, if you want to at the start, to set up client insurance if the consultant it's doesn't need to check so. actually in the PSA, isn't it? Check yep. clause 80. Absolutely. Whereas a short contract, client liabilities oddly are not compensation events. And there's nothing said at all about certificates. And there's absolutely no clause or mechanism for the client to insure. Because again, as Barry keeps telling us, it's designed for a short and simple contract. Termination now, we're getting to the end of the day. PSE, the one party has to notify the service manager and the service manager will issue a termination certificate if it complies with one of the detailed reasons stated promptly. in the contract. Promptly, as Barry would that means. <laughs> oh, don't We don't need to throw that one in. No, there. no, no. Barry's just lobbed that one in. It's a very odd clause. And he sees all very time durations yeah. are very, very promptly. sorted. And yet there was one word in, in ECC and PSE the service manager has to issue the termination certificate promptly. And NEC nerds like yourself joke about, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> um, in the PSC, you've got three different dispute resolution options. Again, exactly the same as in the construction contract. Whereas the short contract, either party notifies the other direct, because remember, there's no intermediary. There is no service manager. So we've got to go direct to the other party. I think I want to terminate. There is a dispute resolution provision rolled up into one clause 93. It's very similar to the logic of W1 and it provides for adjudication. And as we mentioned before, yeah. there's a few extra words relating to that if the Housing Grant Act applies. Good timing. Did we, what did we say at the start? <clears throat> and what have we tried to convince you? It's simpler. It's designed for simple low risk contracts. There aren't any options, but you can build stuff in. And as I mentioned, particularly on the payment, there's that little bit more flexibility, perhaps even than NEC wants us to have. It's theoretically all in one document, but remember Barry and Richard suggest have a pointer to the documents in the contract data. There is no service manager. It's just client and consultant. Mix of lump sums, quantities, work on a time charge basis. Remember, NEC says you can't mix them. Richard and Murray says you can if you do it carefully. <laughs> no requirements for programme unless you've stated what you want and you've got to state in some detail what you want in the scope. Mm -hmm. Compensation event process, remember, is simpler because if there is, if the consultant is notifying, before they notify, they get somebody to put together a quotation. So we're moving it forward quicker. Either party can state assumptions. That is just a flag for talk to each other. What sort of assumptions is either side happy to see in that compensation? Remember the assumptions take risk back to the client or place risk back with the client. There's no option to ask for revised quotation. Again, talk to each other. So you shouldn't, I mean, this is the same in any contract and particularly any C. I think you should not ever be submitting a quotation unless you're fairly confident that the other side's going to accept it because you've already seen it. You've talked about it. That's well, the way we should be in, trying in to fact, work. In fact, of course, if you, what is it, 62 point, if you look at that, the first two key words in there says after discussing yeah, a absolutely. quotation. And yeah. I think people overlook that. That's so important. That Well, that, again, again, I'm, I'm going I'm to have to correct Barry this time. I'm going to get my own back. Because 62.1 is own the, the after discussing words yep. is only when you want an alternative quotation, yeah. which is not in the short contract. No. More detail. Let's not go there, Barry. Come no, on, no. we're nearly getting finished. But the principle is to talk to each other. Very definitely, the principle is to talk, talk to, to each other. Talk to each other. Um, a lot of time as we there. said, if the client doesn't respond in time, <laughs> treated as accepted. So that's your takeaway page, mm. I like to think, from this session you've had this afternoon. We have um, one sort of question. Yeah, with please. regards to um, the lack of requirement for program updates. So um, is there a potential conflict with the 25% retention being held if the client does not formally instruct formal program updates, i.e. an omission okay. would be good, the risk? Good, good question, yeah. but the 25% the um, retention only applies to the first program in the standard NEC, whether PSC or short contract. Yeah. So the 25% only applies to the first program. It's NEC's mechanism for really commercially incentivizing the consultant to get a freaking program in place. Yeah. 
So I've seen a lot of Z clauses by clients which 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 make that clause and the potential retention apply to programs throughout the contract, but that's not standard. Okay, yeah. I think that's yeah. I think that's answered the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope. Okay, so fair enough then. When are we going to use it? Now we we struggle with this one because it's very difficult to give a black and white answer. Mm. So we came up with this very simple picture. What we think we've tried to get across to you is that if risk and complexity are on the bottom end, we can use the short contract, yeah. irrespective of value. Yeah. But if risk and complexity are on the right-hand side of the graph, let's push to the PSC. But obviously, there's not a magic clean line there. We were talking about this, oh no, I don't know, forget, I'm sorry, I was going to say, in, in the construction contract equivalent, our friends at Yorkshire Water years ago used to have a half a million pound draw. Yeah, the line was a half a million pound between the big contract yeah. and the little contract. We think that's wrong. We think it should be about risk and complexity. But I scribbled a line on my slide to emphasize the fact that it's not. Yeah, a there's nice, no hard line. There's really. no clear cut number. Yeah. So when are you going to use it? Well, let's go. I'm going to jump straight to the bottom. As an alternative to the PSC, we can use this short contract. For straightforward professional services, we don't need sophisticated management techniques. We don't need the fancy program. And it's generally a fairly low risk thing. And if the beauty of the short contract, honestly, I do it in Montmedal very frequently. You can put together a tender document for a short contract in about half a day. OK, the scope it could take six weeks because the scope is going to be difficult, whatever it is. Yeah. But the basic the wrapper around it is very, very simple mm. in the short contract, obviously, because you haven't got the options. Yeah. So you fill out the boxes. And it's quick and easy to use. It's quick well. and easy. Very definitely quick and easy to use. Reminder that we can use it for anything. It's not just a construction contract. In fact, this, this contract's got nothing to do with construction. It's just a professional yeah. service. Price for anything. But again, criticality is what what is what we're saying. I think we said that so many times now. We've, we've given out again particularly if you've got a lot of interfaces and a lot of issues like that, you are going to want a decent program and you might go the whole hog and use the PSC to give you that, that complicated program. Good example, actually, a really good example. If you're appointing a only, if you're appointing a consultant just to be the supervisor or just to be the ECC project manager, I'd certainly recommend the short contract. Yeah. If you're appointing Richard Patterson or Barry Treves to give you a little training course, you're going to need a contract. So yeah. you should come back to me when I try and get you to sign up to yeah. the Mott McDonald two-page contract. You should say, <laughs> Richard, why on earth are you not using the NEC contract? I haven't had anybody say that yet, but um, I'm sure they will. Um, a little plug now from uh, NEC. Coming up very shortly, or just 21st of June, we have the, the big do that NEC has once a year. It's a fantastic event. Um, I've been to it many, many times at the fine institution of civil engineers at one Gould Street, Gould Street in Westminster. It is the day for NEC people to get together. And I'm sure Fahan, who's organized these, these webinars yeah. for us, thank you, Fahan. I'm sure he's busy in the, he told us before we started, he's busy on the process of, of getting that organized. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know whether we've gone past the date for the Martin Barnes Awards. I think no, no. The awards you do have until the fifteenth. So if anyone, okay, yeah, still got well, the fifteenth. If you want to get your chance then to get, it get in. your name in lights, it's a very, yeah. it's a very good. I mean, as I say in 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 my company, I say it's a very good, relatively easy PR opportunity. Mott McDonald week last year. It's, it's, it's amazing as as you noticed, Fahan. In Hong Kong, they love their awards. Yes. And and so last year with Arup. Our Mott's Arup joint venture won Consultant of the Year or something from NEC. Yeah, doesn't that sound good, doesn't it? I, I like that because somebody made the effort on the awards. Yeah. Okay, that's you, all we you have for you today. Um, um, it's five to the hour, which is a pretty good effort. Yeah. Um, I'd like to think we've got some questions out there. I don't believe it was all that simple. And um, please don't be shy. Barry and I, as I hope you've seen, we're quite a friendly pair. Yeah. Any questions you've got? There are no stupid questions. OK, I promise. And I think, yeah. again, you know, as we said, that if you have, we've got we've got five minutes to answer some questions. Don't worry if we don't get to, to do them in the five minutes, because we've done the same thing with uh, the one on Tuesday yeah. that we've had lots of questions and we've actually 
put together responses on and that. And we've come so. up with a written response and that will yeah. get shared out along with the slides and the recording. So, yeah. but that said, talk to us. Drop yeah. drop a note in that chat box now and Fahan will yeah. talk to yeah, you. Yeah, we've got a few. To speak to yeah. Us. yeah, we've got a few um, questions here. Um, okay. one, yeah. one is just a sort of technical one, just to confirm that PSPD does stand for uh, price per services provided to date. Is that yeah, correct? have, I, have yeah. I used a CMA in my slide? I do apologize. Completely, completely mean a, it's that a, a, a CMA, <laughs> the, the best thing you're going to learn today is that a CMA <laughs> is a completely meaningless acronym. And apologies for dropping that into my slides. I should know better. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, the other question is um, why are assumptions in quotations allowed from the consultant in the short form and not in the uh, full? Oh, oh, a what a lovely question <laughs> that is that is a, i think we might have debated that before actually, that actually is a, know, yes absolute peach of a question um the the the, the logic mm. in the psc is that it's the service manager on behalf of the client who is the one that's going to make the decisions about mm. risk allocation within yeah. a compensation event quotation yeah, yeah. and therefore we you know it's left to the service manager to state those what we say in training is that if the consultant knows that they need a quotation to uh, an assumption yeah. to be stated then the consultant needs to knock on the door of the service manager and get the service manager to give them those assumptions yeah, yeah. that's what we say in the big contracts but and it's a really good point when i first read that in the short contract which i've got to look at much more recently than the big contracts i'll be honest I was quite surprised that the consultant can do that, but it comes back to what Barry and I've been saying all the way through today, talk to each other. Talk to each other. All we're trying to do mm. is get a piece of paper on the table that both sides are happy with. Mm. And if, if the client's not happy with a, uh, with a quote is with an assumption that the consultant is trying to put in, yeah, that won't get accepted. Yeah. So, but let's have a discussion first, but really, really good question. You get yeah. gold star think, for that one. I think the, the to me in the main contracts, I, I always I take a very simplistic view that you've got your service manager, the service managers there on behalf of the client to ensure they get what they get. And really, the, to me, their controlling document is a scope. So they should be controlling that scope. And when they are asking for effectively or instructions to change that scope, they should be very clear about what's in that scope yeah. change. That that to me is how I simply look at it. Absolutely. That's the absolutely controlling document. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 again, another thing, you know, this, this presentation, obviously, we've tried to keep short and sharp. It's, we we should, we should have said, said this. What we haven't done, nobody has done, is put together a detailed document of what's not in the peer, in the short mm. contract. Mm. So the one that just cropped up there, yeah. the PSC NEC4 has got a much better provision for a quotation for, sorry, for a asking the consultant for a quotation for a proposed change yeah. to the scope. That's in clause 65.1. I know the number because I'm a sad NEC person. So PSC 65.1 has a nice clause for that. Though, So give a quotation before I even instruct the change. Short contract hasn't got that option. Yeah. Which I think what we said, you know, I think what, what it then emphasizes is that talking to each other is important in the PSC. I think in the short contract, it's even more, even more important that we talk to each other and discuss those things. Yeah. Because that's how you streamline it. And Absolutely. That, and that, yeah. Okay, see if we've got any more questions. Um, yes, uh, I think we do have time for one more. So um, we, oh, let's see. It's better be an easy one now. <laughs> <laughs> we've only got a minute, come on. Yes, is the um, service manager, PSC, meant to be independent of the client? Okay, that's a lovely question, classic question. Um, in UK law, Anybody who is put in a position as an intermediary between two parties an in, in, a, an aid, in, in their contract mm -hmm. is required by the law to be independent and impartial. Yeah. However, in the real world, that person, if they are employed by the client, mm -hmm. but when, so when they're assessing payments as required under the contract, they've got to do it 100% independently and you know, impartially. The difficulty then comes when it comes to assessing compensation events. We haven't mentioned the F word today. Can't believe I got through a whole compensation oh, there we are. without mentioning the F word. <laughs> uh, NEC compensation events are all based on forecasts. And therefore, a forecast will never be right. 
and a contractor's for sorry a consultant's forecast might always be probably a little bit on the higher side than the service manager might like mm. and despite the, this requirement to be impartial i don't think you can get away from the fact that in the compensation assessments the service manager is effectively negotiating the deal and that pan they're negotiating the deal they've got to give what the contract says is appropriate mm. but when it comes to forecast and negotiating you can't get away from the fact that the service manager is going to be mm. on and, the client side and, course, and with the short contract of course we haven't got that intermediary at all we've just got the client yeah now is the client going to be doing it independent and impartially yeah. the client is not legally required to be impartial no. but the client knows that if the client's not impartial and fair the consultant's got a very good contract to go back and give them a good slap and then, of course, the important thing is our objective test of how to assess it normally would come back. We might not have it is a program. Well, it's not. Don't start that this time. Away. Listen, <laughs> it's gone one o'clock. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that was useful. As you can see, Barry and I have had too much fun sat here chatting away about our favourite contracts. Uh, I hope it's been useful to you. Um, let us know if it's been useful or otherwise. Um, any, any feedback on suggestions for making them better? Please let uh, Farhan have them. I'm sure he's keen to, to yeah. have one. A um, lot of effort goes into organising things. So thanks very much to Farhan. It seems yeah, like well about three or four months ago that you you touted the idea. Um, we chose, I think I was the one that pushed to have two separate ones. And what, some, if you've been to both of these sessions, you'll realise that they're very, very similar, in which case I sort of apologise yeah. But I think the my line was that there's two different audiences yeah. for the two different presentations. And I think that was the right decision. Yeah. OK, yeah. sorry, shut up, Richard. Shut up, Barry. Yeah. All right. Anyway, good luck, so everyone. everyone. Um, and make sure you enter the Martin Barnes Award. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. Um, thanks, everyone. OK, um, thank you. Bye. OK, goodbye now. Cheers.